All right, good morning. Well, here we go. I'm tied to the podium. Anyways, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm very, very excited. And I'm also nervous. I'm excited because some of the most interesting and exciting revelations and understanding about healthcare I've, I've come to know through the last few years of some clinical research. And I'm really nervous because I only have 25 minutes to share it with you. So, you know, in keeping with our healthcare oath, the first thing is, as a practitioner is to do no harm. And my concern is I'm going to overload your neurology in a way that is going to actually uh, be an adverse effect rather than a beneficial one for you. So, you know, we'll try and make this really, you know, and again, you know, what's the relevance of what I have to say? And so today it's kind of, it's a, it's a mixed audience, which is incredibly exciting. You know, and more than anything, there's, there's clearly a number of questions that we need to answer. And I've been practicing for 35 years, uh, studying and practicing work on the upper cervical spine. You know, and it's, I think we all have a kind of personal relationship to this, this question around health and in particular vascular insufficiency. And for me, when I got into chiropractic college, I got into it out of interest because I knew it helped muscular skeletal issues, back pain, you know, and that kind of function. When I was in school, I, ent I got introduced to Dr. Mich Marshall Dickholz, Jr., which Dr. Woodfield talked about, Dr. Dickholz, Sr. So there's a father and son uh, team in Chicago. And Dr. Dickholz, Sr., who still practices at 89 and is uh, doing clinical research, it was his son who was a, a classmate of mine and introduced me to this thing called NUCA. And when I received my first NUCA correction, it wasn't that I, a muscular ache or pain went away. For me, it was like somebody lifted this fog and I could think straight for the first time. Like I didn't know what that was. And then when I, it just piqued my interest so much. And what was really odd about it, it was such a subtle intervention and yet had such a profound impact on my thinking. You know, and it took, I knew that I imp it was something that was impacted by that correction. And then in my clinical practice, I saw it thousands and thousands of times. I saw people's lives transform. They could think straight, they could function better, there, there was a more optimal neurology. But it, it's only recently that the technology has brought us to the place where we now understand why that happened. And even more recently, including within the last year, it was validated in a conversation with a friend of mine. And you know, life sort of happens while we make other plans. I don't know about you, but... <clears throat> so many years ago, a high school friend of mine, you know, we do the things high school guys do, and we hang out. You know, and then we go on our separate journeys. And 35 years later, 30, yeah, more than that, actually, uh, we came back together in this last year. And this friend of mine, Doug Hamilton, and Doug is a, he's a fascinating guy, and I hope, you know, he gets a chance to speak at some of these conferences. Because Doug started out as an engineer. And then he got his master's in biomedical engineering. And then, you know, he was kind of a curious guy, so he went on to do his MD. And that wasn't challenging enough, so he did a PhD in vascular physiology at the same time. And so there was, you know, and this is all here in Calgary. And then Doug went on to work at NASA. And for the last 15, 20 years, has been a flight surgeon doing research on uh, a variety of health issues, also building equipment to to understand what goes on in space and how to bring those vital statistics back to Earth. But the most relevant piece that's brought Doug and I back together, and as Dr. Woodfield talked about the phase contrast angiography that Dr. Noam Alpern has developed, it's a way of looking into the brain. And most MRI technologies are like looking at a photograph. What Dr. Alpern has developed is a non-invasive way to read the brain in a functional way. <clears throat> so. With that information, we can read um, the blood flow into the brain, the blood flow out of the brain. And the patient's hooked up to an EKG, so the cardiac gating allows us to track that over the cardiac cycle. And that's the technology that we're using in a migraine study, which I'll allude to in a minute, uh, here in Calgary. So anyway, um, Dr. Alpern was up in Calgary last year installing the software on the magnet that we're using for our study. And uh, he says, you know, I've got a, I can't meet this morning because I have a conference call with NASA. I'm doing a project with them. I said, oh, do you happen to know Doug, Doug Hamilton? He goes, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. I said, oh, I'll say hi to Doug. 
So, um, as it turns out, um, NASA has lost most of the funding, so they've, they've closed their space program. <clears throat> Doug has moved back to Calgary, and uh, we got together a few times since he's, been ret he's returned, and we started talking about the work he's doing and the work I'm doing. And the central piece is that we've both been working with Dr. Alprin using the same technology to understand intracranial pressure management. And so, what he sees and what I see are very similar just in different environments. And so that's part of what I want to share with you today, is what we're seeing. You know, the thing is that the truth is always there. Our capacity to see it hasn't always been available. And so the technology, which is the exciting piece, is that we can now look in and understand the body from a functional way, not a dynamic, or a, not a static way. Because we're human beings that are constantly in a state of change. Nothing really stays the same. And so, what is it that we can do to alter an environment that also changes how that physiology functions? And that's what's my area of interest, is in, you know, and we don't clinically treat conditions, we actually work to optimize the physiology of each individual. And so, you know, with that in mind, and our training, you know, I've, I've had the, um, uh, the good fortune to be trained in a, in a profession that looks towards the body's nature and works to optimize that. As compared to kind of, you know, putting a particular set of symptoms into a box and saying, you know, this is what you've got and let's figure out all the ways we can treat that and, you know, sort of sometimes even rage war on that kind of thing. My interest isn't so much in re eliminating symptoms as it is optimizing that physiology and aligning us with our nature. And my experience seems that clinically, our nature is one that is driven towards health. It's, it's driven towards uh, a stabilization. And there's an intelligence. I've watched it and I've seen it. And we all know it. You know, and we just have to look outside in, in nature. There's an intelligence that drives things to be optimal. So how can we work with that? And so that's where my work comes in is that you know, there's this big picture and then there's the, the small picture. And the small picture of my work has to do with one specific part of the spine, the upper cervical spine. And I've always claimed that I'm lazy, simply because I want to do the least amount, get the greatest result, and not have to do it a lot again. And that's what Nuke was about. So with that in mind, the, the orientation to health, um, for me, one of the, the, the few key, key people that's also altered my way of looking at health has been a body of work done by Dr. Sonia Lupian in uh, Montreal. <clears throat> and she has developed what's called an allostatic load model. And her, you know, what she said um, to me and everyone else, uh, the opposite of stress isn't relaxation, it's resilience. And that really triggered something for me because the body, you know, most of the time when it's in a state of dysfunction has lost its resilient capacity. And so uh, her website, humanstress.ca, has a vast amount of knowledge around, you know, things that can be done for building resilience. Go ahead. So again, you know, the, our approach clinically is to find a very personalized protocol that works to enhance nature and, you know, really reduce um, you know, what's getting in the way, the barrier that gets in the way of expression of optimal well-being. You know, and that's no simple thing, you know, and it requires, from my experience, it really requires an integrated model. You know, it is not um, a treating of a condition as much as an integration. And as you're hearing today, you know, there's this vast amount of information. You know, we, we learn about, you know, the amount of iron. We, we look at, you know, the... Uh, all the different interventions, and it gets really complicated, doesn't it? You know, and then you kind of end up with more questions than answers, you don't know where to go, what to do. You know, but if you can think of it in terms of somewhere along the line, for a very logical reason, your body has lost its resilient adaptive capacity. And our ability to adapt to change is one of our key things physiologically. Our, you know, and we call these things homeostasis. That's the body's natural biological drive to balance. You can put two 25 kilo items on a teeter-totter and create balance. You can put two 400 kilo items on create balance. But the load that that system has to carry 
is so significant that eventually the system will start to fail. And if the load exceeds the capacity of that system, it breaks or it'll fail. So allostasis is really the body's capacity to maintain stability well under great load and going through a series of changes. So for me, this model it creates a very important context behind how we view healthcare. And everything in our clinical approach, through my clinic specifically, is designed to build allostatic load capacity and improve resilience. So really, NUCA is about getting your head on straight. We look at this one particular area, and we have all those, yes. <laughs> and it, it, it happens in many ways, so. Uh, but we have one very specific protocol, as Dr. Woodfield alluded to, that's a very standardized kind of protocol for actually helping getting your head on straight. We start with the top, you know, take it from the top. The head, a 12 to 14 pound mass, sits on top of the atlas, or the C1 vertebrae. And it's a ring structure. The central nervous system travels through the center, and around that is the cerebrospinal fluid. There is also vascular components that we're talking about. But again, there's an optimal alignment there that needs to be in place. And when we look at the spine, we look at the body, and from my orientation, nothing is separate. Nothing is segmental. You know, people often talk about this one segment's doing something. It's a kinetic chain. It's all interconnected. So, we just happen to influence a part of the upper cervical spine that also has a very direct relationship to a part of the brain stem called the reticular formation. The reticular formation neurologically has a job. Its job is to send information to the postural muscles of the spine to keep it in alignment and balanced. It takes sensory information from the inner ear, from all the sensory places in the body that give us a relationship to where we are in, in relationship to gravity and through time and space. And I know specifically, with, M with many of the MS patients that I've seen over the years, one of the first things that seems to show up is a loss of sensory capacity and stability of their gait. You know, and so there seems to be a real interesting relationship. Again, more answers need to be brought forward in terms of that area. Go ahead. There is a lot of consequence to that spine being misaligned. And again, the technology is now allowing us the capacity to really see that more detail. <clears throat> it affects not just the neurology, but now we understand the impact that it's having on the hemodynamic function. So they, again, it's an integrated system. When something goes wrong in one system, another system's going to respond to try and create equilibrium. So we're really working to optimize that upper cervical spine because it's the portal. Every message to and from the body has to follow through that doorway. It's a very, very critical part of the spine. You know, and there's a lot of, uh, there's about 438 chiropractic interventions that attend to creating a healthy spine. So there's many things within the chiropractic profession, profession and we're all oriented towards improving the function of the spine. They all have a little bit different outcome orientation. The NUCA work specifically is a restorative process. It restores optimal alignment. And our protocol, which I'll go over in a second, is very much geared towards restoring that optimal alignment. And Dr. Woodfield spoke to this. The theories around it, we've studied around what's happening when that spine misaligns. There's very close relationship between the ligament structure, the dura, and how that inf impacts flow patterns. And this one is also a slide that Dr. Woodfield showed you. You know, it might as well, perhaps, you know, for those who speak Cantonese, fine, but if you don't speak Cantonese, it would be like showing you a Cantonese menu. I mean, what does this really mean? You know, and again, a static image is one thing. Um, one of the patients that I saw with MS brought a, an MRV from Frankfurt, Germany, into me. And when I, I plugged it in, there was a particular, uh, there was a video um, s a slide, and it was exactly this view. And it, and it was connected to the cardiac cycle. And on each cardiac cycle, there was a lateral deviation of the spinal cord by about three to five millimeters. So in a dynamic form, there's some sort of chronic stimulation to the brain stem, the reticular formation, all the other structures. It's like it creates a hyperactivity and eventually an atrophy or burnout of some capacity. That's a theory I have. I have nothing else to back it up. But for me, it was profoundly interesting to see a dynamic lateral movement of that cord. 
but it makes sense. You know, we don't, we're not static beings, we are dynamic. Things are changing every cardiac cycle. It's an amazing, amazing, complex machine that we're talking about. And I'll, let me reframe that, it's not a machine. You know, our body's capacity, and we often look at the body from a very mechanical point of view. And it, that has some benefits, but we can't forget the dynamic capacity and the innate intelligence that exists within that system driven towards optimizing itself. It'll change and adapt as long as we support it. And so NUCA practitioners are, go through a very you know, rigorous training protocol. And the, uh, the, the educational part is from the NUCA organization itself. In 1966, Dr. Ralph Gregory, who's the man who developed this work, uh, founded the NUCA organization. And then in 1971, he developed well, what was called the National Upper Cervical Research Association, which is now we call UCRF, the Upper Cervical Research Foundation. I studied with Dr. Gregory for about uh, 10 years, you know, until the time he died. I went through my board certification to become certified to teach this work uh, with him, and I gained an immense amount of knowledge and appreciation for the, the infinite number of details that go into that upper cervical spine. And so my commitment today is to also continue that into this next generation of teaching where we, we really look at the small details because it's the subtle things that seem to have the most profound change. Dr. Code, I think, alluded to cranial sacral therapy, a very subtle intervention as well. You know, the and to me, that really speaks to the responsiveness, the aliveness that exists within a human body. It wants to know, it, it knows its way home, it just needs a little bit of guidance. And so even a subtle thing can make such a profound change in how we operate physiologically. People think of upper cervical care as just neck treatment, but in fact it's, it's a global issue. You know, it's a local problem that has a global impact. And so, you know, in this case, we're thinking locally, but it's acting globally. And so when we make that change in that upper cervical spine, you see the change throughout the whole body. One of the things that we start with in terms of determining, and every patient who comes into the clinic, the first question is, is this an appropriate intervention for this person? It's not for everyone. We can't help everyone and we don't try. What we want to do is, though, take on patients that have the clear signs and symptoms and findings of an atlas subluxation complex. So the first thing we do is look at a leg length inequality. It's a very clinical sign that there's brainstem pressure. And what we see is that discrepancy. Once we know that, we move and look at their posture. And so there's an instrument uh, that I use in the clinic, what's called a gravity stress analyzer, which measures postural distortion in three dimensions. The head, the shoulders, and hips should be standing in a well-balanced, optimal relationship to gravity. When it deviates from that, there's a stress on the system. It know, we know there's central stress there. And if we know that there's a distortion, the leg check, everything indicates that we need to take care of that, then we go through to the next step, which is to take a three-dimensional series of x-rays. And from those x-rays, we can determine a very personalized and precise correction pathway to restore the symmetrical balance to that spine. <clears throat> the x-rays and the information from that create this vector, and we introduce a force, and again, in the adjusting steps of the NUCA protocol, uh, there's about 70 steps that the practitioner goes through to align themselves to the X-ray vector to deliver the force precisely and consistently to change that upper cervical spine in three dimensions with one single force. Sounds easy. Ha, you should try it. <laughs> and that's the challenge, and that's the part for me that's also created the greatest interest in this work over 35 years. You know, the work for me uh, and the learning hasn't been so much horizontal as it's been vertical, because I find that you can bring greater and greater levels of subtlety and precision to that correction. And so we know that the better the correction that we provide as measured on post X-ray, and that's part of the NUCA protocol, is to take a post X-ray series to measure the change that's taken place. And what you're looking at here is a set of X-rays, actually I did last week, uh, the individual, um, the pre, and it's really hard to describe, you know, again, you're looking at a Cantonese menu here, but some of the things that um, on the left, there's a red line, which you can't really see, that is the vertical line. 
The upper line represents the center of the mass of the skull. There's a horizontal line that represents the angle in which the C1 vertebrae sits. And the other lower line is the relationship of the rest of the neck to that. And then there's that vertical line <clears throat> on the right that's red, uh, which is where optimally it needs to be. There's a white line that you see on there that's also the center of the x-ray. So there's this massive deviation of that patient. This is, the post x-ray is taken after the first correction, immediately after that first correction. The capacity and possibility to restore balance exists. We've, I've seen it in tens of thousands of people. And when that correction is made, it changes things to profound levels. Our research is now pointing to helping us understand what those actual changes are. So we're doing this research project here. And based on the pilot study that Dr. Woodfield uh, worked on in Chicago, uh, using the non-invasive MRI to look at migraine patients, uh, we saw all these vascular changes going on. And Dr. Woodfield talked about compliance. Compliance is another way of saying resilience. When the spine is misaligned, the blood flow patterns are changed. There's a, a, a tremendous drop in venous outflow capacity when that upper cervical spine is misaligned. Then the resilience or adaptive capacity of the brain to adapt to increase pressure changes drops as well. And so what we're finding, and we're studying migraine patients, and these are patients with anywhere from 10 to 26 headaches days a month. <clears throat> so they're not simple things, and they've been there for many, many years. And so what we're looking at, you know, is when we make this upper cervical correction, you know, how do they respond? Not just symptomatically, but also on the MRI. So there's a baseline MRI done before we do this, uh, the, the correction, and then there's another one done at four weeks and eight weeks. And at this point, we're concluding with the, the last candidate. We've, we've gathered the information so far on you know, their quality of life outcomes, pain levels and things, but we haven't seen any of the MRI data yet because it's all blinded and Dr. Alpern will read that. And so <clears throat> what we're, we're wanting to understand is the physiology behind why this upper cervical correction impacts migraine patients. But migraine patients are very similar to many other vascular things. And living in Calgary with the Chinooks and the amount of weather change that takes place, it's very common that an, an, a trigger or when the load goes up, their adaptive capacity isn't enough to kind of match that. And so there's a symptom that's produced, which is usually a chronic head pain. So what we've seen across the board so far with these patients is that there's a, a reduction in those headache days, number one, and for many they've gone away completely. Others, it's a couple, um, a couple of headaches a day, or excuse me, a couple of headaches, headache days a month. The medication needed to reduce those headaches has gone from very major medications to an over-the-counter. So it take, there's less frequency, less intensity, and less medication needed to manage that. You know, the, my sense is that that's because their, comp their compliance is much greater, their adaptability is much greater, and they have greater resilience. So, <clears throat> well, I appreciate this opportunity immensely to actually share with you a little bit of what we've come to know. You know, and the more I learn, the less I seem to know. But there's some things that I now know very, very clearly and very strongly that, you know, what we're influencing is not just a simple muscular skeletal or brain stem neurological issue, it's impacting the whole system. You know, and it's really my life's work to help um, optimize that physiology for each patient who comes into our clinic. And I'm thrilled to be able to do the research. And I really welcome the chance to explore this area and, and this topic in greater. I thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you.